Hey lady, don't you remember? You was my lover, you was my friend. Hey sister, I know you remember. You left me alone, now you won't back in. Hey mama, don't you hear me? I can't be a sucker for you. Ever since you've been gone, it's been a lot of good things going on. Well, ever since you left that day, yeah, it's been a lot of good things going away. What can I say? Okay, hello, hello. <laughs> What can I say? Ain't no more rainy days. No, no. I'll tell you, when you left me, I thought I would never love again. Cause you had me all confused and twisted up inside. I thought it was something that I
depression under central Texas skies. It made a big impression. All his work in life. He spent the dollar wisely. Frugal to a fault. But he never hesitated to help somebody out. Just another man who loved his wife. Selflessness, the code word of his life. Qui font baisser les miens, un rire qui se perd sur sa bouche. Voilà le portrait sans retouche de l'homme auquel j'appartiens. Quand il me prend dans ses bras, il me parle tout bas. Je vois la béante. Il me dit des mots d'amour, des mots de tout le monde. Real quick, we've got a bunch of stuff to say. Does this sound real tinny? Yeah. I normally don't sound this high. Check bass, check treble, check treble, check bass. We're gonna start in two minutes, y'all. Love the conversations. In their place. Check. Check. We're going to start in two minutes. This is my normal speaking voice. Sounds tinny. Sounds. Okay, that's getting better. That's getting better. Pull it hard, Bob. Pull the door. Check. Check one, two. Check. Check one, two, check, check. Testing, 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 testing. It's very noisy. Testing, testing one. Okay, I can fix that. That's 
testing. Yeah. Better. Better. Yep. Yes. Check. Check one, two, check. Check. Check the mic. Check the mic. Check the mic, one, two, check, check. That's better, that's better. Check, check, we're gonna start in 1.5 minutes. See if you don't mind catching a seat. Get some coffee for the said seat. We're gonna make some uh, announcements and adjust Assess. to Assess. an unusual morning in a good way, in a wonderful way. Oh, all right. Okay, check. Yep, it's a lot better. All right, we are gonna get started <clears throat> as I clear my throat and stop stalling. Welcome to Houston Oasis. We are a community of compassion and reason. We are an alternative to faith-based communities and behind me, you can see our core values, including people are more important than beliefs. My name is Will and I am gonna be your MC for today. Um, we were, this is a great lineup. We had a great lineup, but one of our people in the lineup is not here and that's gonna be our musician. So, there's a small chance the musician will come in a little bit later. Uh, until then, someone's bringing in a little portable piano. So Johnny Rhodes and I are going to do a, uh, a song. We're, just, we're, yeah. we're going to do Ebony and Ivory. No. Someone there, the keyboard's almost here. <laughs> it's the last thing you want from us. <laughs> no musician. Musician may be coming in, in just a bit, maybe not. We will adjust. So I'm going to, actually my announcements, I have more announcements than usual. Basically, around a Secular Week of Action. So Secular Week of Action this year is April 29th through May 7th. What is that, you ask? Well, it's a reaction to what's called National Day of Prayer, which is a day in the first week of May. That's been around for a while. So this is a response to that. So they have National Day of Prayer, we have Secular Week of Action, and this is where we get to schedule a bunch of volunteer events and community things that help your, your our community and do things as secular people to show that we can also do good in this world so we we've worked really hard to put give you a lot of options for that week if you plug into houston oasis meetup and actually secular houston meetup and houston atheist meetup you're going to see the events that we have scheduled so i'm going to run through them real quick what we have at this point is April 29th, I have a, a volunteer shift at the Houston Food Bank, one of my favorites. April 30th, we have a blood drive right here. It's going to be in the back of the auditorium. They're going to uh, put curtains up there, and so you get to donate blood while you're listening to the speaker in one week. I'm sorry, two weeks from today. And so, uh, wonderful way to help uh, your community. And on May 4th, we have two events at the same time, the same place. So there's going to be a voter registration table as well as a Houston Area Women's Center kit assembly. And both of those are going to be at Axelrad uh, at 7 p.m. All of these, again, are on the Houston uh, Oasis Meetup. They're going to be on our Facebook page and on our email, uh, 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 our email uh, weekly updates. So in the May 6th, we have a Project Cure uh, volunteer shift. That's going to be a Saturday. And then May 7th, Sunday. Uh, it's going to be a cleanup of Baker Ripley out here. We're going to have some bags. We get, get out here and clean up uh, uh, the area. Uh, they've been wonderful hosts to us over the years, and uh, one way to, to help back, to help, yeah, help, uh, help, help them as they've uh, helped us and um, clean up some trash in the in the process. Of note, the I'm going to call it Hawk Houston Area Women's Center. It's, uh, it's an acronym. So Hawk Kits Assembly. We, Houston Oasis, are going to assemble items for two separate kits. One's like a toiletry kit, and one is a hospital visit kit. 
and there are certain items that they want in each kit, and we're going to post them. We have posted them, but we're going to post them on our Facebook page and try to make it easy for you to help us assemble these things, either buy these items, and the clothes need to be n new clothes, but we'll let you know what type of clothes they are, and the toiletries, obviously new toiletries. So if you want to buy these items yourself, do it now, because we need time to assemble these and take them with us to Axelrad on the day, which is going to be May 4th. If you want to donate money to us so that we can buy these items, do it sooner than later. We need time to go out and physically buy these things, get them, and take them to the kit assembly. So we love donations last minute, but please, please do it sooner than later just because we need lead up time. Another thing that needs a little bit of lead up time is the blood donation. So that's going to be in two weeks from today in the back of this right here in the building. So sign up for a time slot. Uh, Walk-ins are definitely welcome, but you may not get the time you want. So it, it, sign up now or sooner than later for the time slot. There's a QR code in the back that you can um, use your phone and get a, uh, on a time slot. We're gonna give, they're going to give away free t-shirts, and it's a wonderful way to help your fellow human with donating blood, which is always in dire need. It's a lot. I, know, I never talk this much. <clears throat> all right so with that I'll have a couple more announcements I'll remind you all uh, a little bit later but um, part of this is stalling for time because we have a, a gap and Johnny doesn't want to sing with me um. <laughs> no no solo <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm pulling up our speak I want to get our speakers bio correct so with all that, I'm going to introduce our speaker, which, which I'm really excited to, uh, to hear what he has to say. Uh, Mr. Bart Campolo. Uh, he is a secular community builder, counselor, and writer who currently serves as the humanist chaplain at the University of Cincinnati. He also hosts a podcast called Humanize Me. He is the son of Tony Campolo, a prominent Christian evangelical pastor and was a pastor himself before becoming a secular humanist, my favorite type of humanist. So with that introduction, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Mr. Bart Cambolo. Thank you. Oh, is that, that's very loud. What can I do to be softer? Is it, are you softening me? Good, I need to be softened. Thank you for that sitting ovation. Um, it's just a joke. I'm so glad to be here. Actually, what I should say is I'm so glad to be back here. Um, I, it's funny, I, I, I've met a couple... Okay, what am I doing wrong? Oh, there you go. I've met a couple of old-timers, people that have been part of this community since the very beginning. How many of you were here in the early days? Oh, a significant number, okay. So I came here many years ago. I mean, I think it was like six, seven, eight years ago. Um, and, I, and, and it was one of the highlights of my, of my early secular life because I was wondering, was there such a thing as an, a secular community where everybody wasn't just pissed off all the time? And, and I came here, and, and, and people were so nice. And I thought, this is what I'm looking for. And, and probably some of you are still here because this was what you were looking for. Um, I'm, I'm sad to see, though, that you've, you've, you've stopped liking each other so much so that you want to sit very far apart. Um, I, I, it's, that's a COVID era thing, right? Is that it? You just guys still haven't gotten used to sitting close next to each other anymore. That's all right. That's all right. So are we good on the sound? Is it, is, is it okay for everybody? Okay, we're good. All right, so here's the deal. Um, when secular audiences that I go to talk to, when they find out that I'm the son of a famous evangelical preacher, and my dad is a famous evangelical cr preacher, um, you know, who, who, who kind of traveled the world, preaching the gospel and like was Bill Clinton's personal pastor when he was in the White House and in trouble. Um, when they find that out 
And, then, and when they find out that I spent 30 years of my life as an evangelical inner city missionary and running around giving talks to youth groups and, and, and conventions all over the place and churches, when they figure that out, what they assume is that I'm going to tell the story of how I left Christianity, of my like sort of deconversion story. And I'm not. And the reason I'm not is because most of those stories, they're all the same. Most, I mean, most of them are the same. You know, like somebody's like, yeah, I, uh, I read a book uh, and I figured out that this was all nonsense and I couldn't hold on to it anymore. You know, or, you know, I got really treated badly by Christians in, in this church because I was gay or because I was a woman or, or, you know, or because I was married to the wrong person. And, 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 and when I left and, and didn't go every week, it stopped seeming important to me. You know, like the stories, there's a certain sameness to deconversion stories. And so instead, I, I never tell that story. What I usually do is I usually tell the story not of how I left Christianity, but of how I joined it in the first place. How as a teenager, I became a Christian. And the reason I tell the story of what drew me into Christianity was because what drew me to, into Christianity wasn't the Christian narrative. I don't know how that could draw anybody in. You know, God loves you so much and he'll kill you forever if you don't accept it. You know, what, the reason I like to talk about how I got into, the, how, I, how I got saved, if you will, is because it's a way of illustrating the attraction and the transformative power of a loving, purposeful community. That there's something incredibly compelling about a group of people that share the same values and that kind of have a, a, a set of tribal rituals and, and that are doing something that, that, that in a sense they feel like they're part of a movement that's bigger than themselves and that isn't just about them but it's about making things better for others. And, and, and again, the reason why I, I gave that talk a lot was because I would go to a lot of secular communities that hadn't figured out that just not believing in God isn't enough to build a community around. That at some point you have to figure out not what don't you believe, but what are you committed to? What, is it, what, is it, what holds you together? What, what's your reason for being a group? Because there's a huge need out there. There's, a, there's, there's tremendous numbers of people in our society who feel alienated, who feel alone who don't have close friends, who don't have a sense of, of vision and purpose, who are depressed, who are anxious. Are you aware of the mental health crisis in our country? Because being a therapist, I'm so aware of it. People come into my office every day who think that they have mental health problems. And in an alarming number of cases, they don't have mental health problems. They're just lonely as hell and they need somebody to talk to and they have to pay 125 bucks an hour to get it because they, they haven't learned the skills because they're not, they're not comfortable enough in, 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 in groups of people but mainly because nobody's engineered a social setting where a socially awkward person can make friends. It's really hard to make friends. I, it's funny, I heard a couple walking in here said they had moved here from Seattle. Where are you Seattle people? You're moving to Seattle. Come talk to me afterwards. Because one of the other most loving secular communities I know is in Seattle. Yeah, and I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you to the nicest people you're ever going to meet there. But when people move to a new city, it's a crisis for a lot of us. Where am I going to make friends? How am I going to find people that share my values? Where am I going to find people that will accept me? And in my church days, it was easy. You just look for the Presbyterian church, and if you didn't like that one, you went around the corner of the Baptist church. Like somewhere they would find nice people, and they were always happy to have you. But if you're a secular person, if you're somebody who wants, who's committed to love as a lifestyle without any supernatural trappings, it's, it can be very hard. 
And so oftentimes I talk to people about the need for secular communities, but it seems stupid to come here and talk to you guys about the need for a secular community. You figured that out. Last night I was hanging out with Jacob and some of your gang at, at, at some German hot dog restaurant. Um, my wife told me when I was going on this trip, she said, be sure you eat something green. And I don't think there was anything green within 50 yards of that place. But as I talked to people last night, the more I talked with members of your community, the more it occurred to me that what you folks and I have most in common, probably, m most of you, some, now nah, nah, we're in Houston, all of you, the, the thing that we have in common is the persistent need to explain ourselves to Christian friends and Christian family members who are trying to understand how we could possibly live without God. Can anybody relate to that? Does, does anybody come from a background where you have to explain yourself? Can I get a witness? And you might say, oh no, no, I don't have any friends like that, but like my Uber driver, like the, 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 the lady at the, at the drugstore, the, poli the political campaigners that come to my door, so many people in a community like this are, 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 are faith-based. So many people are doing that, and, and so many of them are distraught by the way we're living our lives. You say, how could they be distraught? Like, we're such nice people. But they are. And the more committed they are to the faith, especially the evangelical ones, the more worried they are that if we don't change our minds, what? will burn in hell forever. But even the ones that aren't worried about us burning in hell, they're worried about us being alone. They're worried about us not being moral. They're worried about us not having a moral compass. Sometimes it's our parents. Sometimes it's our kids. Sometimes it's our neighbor. Sometimes it's some, somebody at work. And so, as, as I was talking to those people last night, I decided to change what I was going to talk about a little bit. Now, in the old days, in my old preacher days, I would have said, but the Holy Spirit gave me a word. <laughs> uh, but either way, I, I, I just changed my mind. Um, but either way, uh, it, it means that this talk I'm going to give you, it may not be polished, as polished as the other one, but it'll be fresh. There'll be It'll be dynamic, because I'm into it. So uh, a number of years ago, this, uh, when, I, when I first came out of the faith, and, and, and it was a big deal in Christendom, because my dad was a big deal. And, I, you know, to be honest with you, I was kind of, a, kind of a big deal for a little while there in Christendom. And so when I left the faith and people found out about it, they wrote newspaper articles and magazine things. Um, I ended up getting a, a written up in the New York Times, and, and, and everyone was, oh, you know, my, my five seconds of fame. And... Uh, and this guy came and did a documentary film. And, 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 and he said, I want to document you and your father talking to each other. Because my father had a really hard time with my deconversion. And, he, and, and what had happened was is that my father and I were, were, were working stuff out. And my friend said, hey, could I just come and set up a ca camera and, 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 and watch you guys talk to each other for a while? And he ended up making a documentary film about it. I think it was called Leaving My Father's Faith. And from that point on, as soon as that documentary got released, I started hearing from people all over the country who were like, how do you still have a relationship with your father where you can talk openly about stuff like that? Where he asks you questions about what you believe and you listen to him talk about what he believes and it's not hostile. How do you do that? I ended up starting a podcast called Humanize Me which was kind of about how, how to make sense of life, how to make the most of life on the other side of faith. And I got even more emails from people. And they would always say the same thing. They would always say, I wish I had heard you before I told my family that I wasn't a Christian anymore. Because I really, I, we, we made a hash of it and we're, we, we still haven't dug out.
And so in the end, I, I sort of figured out, like, you know what might be a good thing for us to know? Might be especially a good thing for you to know. Because even if you've been out of it for 20 years, or maybe you were never even in it. But like, but like even, if, even, even if it's not an issue for you anymore, there are going to be people that are going to come to Oasis over and over again who are fresh. And the question is, 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 is how do you equip those people? How do you equip people to be genuine ambassadors of humanist goodness in the world? How do we relate to those people in a way that isn't toxic? And so literally, I, I sat up last night after I got home from the... I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep after eating that food. Um, but uh, I, 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 I sat up and I made... I, I've got seven ideas for you, okay? And I'm just going to run them through them really fast. Now, my understanding is, is that if somebody comes up here and they lay out some cool ideas for you, then we take a break and then people are allowed to ask questions, right? Okay. I feel good about this then. So the first thing I would say to you about dealing with, a, especially, did, did any of you grow up in the faith? Did any of you grow up in, as, as part of the faith? Okay, so you, okay. So this is for you. The first and most crucial thing to do when you are encountering a Christian who wants to talk to you about faith is, this is if you get nothing else out of this, this would be my best advice is, start off by telling them all the stuff you learned in church that you still appreciate and that you're still grateful for. Start out by telling them the values that you learned in church and the experiences that you had in church and the skills that you gained in church and the role models that you met in church, all the good stuff, any good thing that happened to you. And you say, Bart, you don't understand. I got, I got, what? I got knocked around. They, they messed with my sexuality. They, they filled my head with fear. I still am struggling with like post-religious trauma. And, and, like I got, I got nothing but anger and pain. And I'm like, I know, but underneath all that, somewhere something good happened to you. I'm not saying the narrative made any sense, but there was a Sunday school teacher who was nice to you. Or the music inspired you. Or you learned to cook on a retreat in the kitchen with the other, the other leaders. Like, somewhere, somehow, there must have been something good that happened there. I mean, now don't get me wrong. I don't give Christian... Like, like, I... Forgiveness. I learned about forgiveness in church. Now, don't get me wrong. Christianity didn't invent forgiveness. <laughs> There's a tremendous, like, natural case to be made for forgiveness. Like, elephants forgive. Wolves forgive, right? Like, any social animal knows that, like, in, there's going to be conflict within the tribe, and if you can't resolve the conflict, the tribe will fall apart and you'll all die. Forgiveness is just a really good idea. There's lots of great stuff about forgiveness. And the truth is, you can learn forgiveness in 97 other places, but I didn't. I learned about it in church. You say, but, but, but it's not specific to church. That's true. Like, you know, you know what's funny is like, I, uh, I'm loyal to Philadelphia. I, I root for Philadelphia sports teams. You say, but, but they're not better than other teams. Like, why don't you root for the Texans? Because I grew up in Philadelphia. And you go like, but there's nothing intrinsically better. I know, it's just where I learned, it's, I, like, I, I learned to like sports in Philadelphia, so those are my teams. That's how I am about Christianity. I don't, I don't believe in Christianity. I don't go to church. I'm not a Christian in any way, shape, or form. There's not a supernatural believing bone in my body. But I still speak with that accent. Does that make any sense? I mean, just, I mean, any of you that grew up in church, you're just watching me walk around and you're going like, this, some of you are triggered right now. You're going like, oh my God, he reminds me of every youth pastor I ever met. Because <laughs> that's what I was, right? Like, it, and it, you, you go like, oh, you know, people would say like, oh, the Lord has given me a great love for kids and, and, and God just laid on my heart. And I like, forget the Lord. I mean, I love kids. I, if I hadn't been a youth pastor at a church, I would have been a youth pastor at a mosque if I was born in Afghanistan. Like, I'm a kid guy. 
It wasn't Christianity that made me that way, but that's where it found expression. That's where I learned it. And, and, and the, you say, well, why, why would you want to emphasize that to your Christian friends? Because the rest of it's going to be hard for them. It's going to be easy for you to define the things that are different. And so you start out by defining the things that you're grateful for, the places that you have common ground. Because what you're essentially saying is, is, I see value in what you do. I see value in the community that you're a part of. And anybody that's ever traveled around the world knows that if you can't find and articulate what you value about the culture that you're in, you're not going to do very well with those people. So the first thing you do is that. Second thing you do is, is that at, at whatever point you have to talk about like, well, if it's so great, why did you leave it? I think the most important thing I could say is, is that don't tell them why you're not a Christian or why you're not a Muslim or why you're not whatever they are. Don't give them their, your reasons. Don't tell them what's wrong with their faith or why their story makes no sense or what the evidence says for two reasons. Number one is they already know. I mean, some of you grew up in church, so you know this. Like, there isn't a Christian alive that hasn't gone like, this story doesn't make any sense. Or I don't know if, why do I, is the Bible really true? Or is there really a God? I mean, like, really, the doubts that took you out of Christianity, did, they, did, did you leave Christianity the moment that doubt first occurred to you, or did you live with it for 20 years? Most of us struggled. In, they, so, like, you're not going to be telling anybody anything new. What you're going to be telling them is, I'm here to get you. And so what I would encourage you to do is not to, not to list your reasons but to tell your story. Just tell the story of how it happened to you. In, in, in therapy, we always tell people, in a conflict, use I statements. Have you ever heard somebody say, use I statements? And what that means is, instead of saying like, I hate it, you always interrupt me. And you, you, and you, and you never listen to me. That's one way you could say it. Or you could say, you know what? Sometimes I feel unheard. And I feel like, I can't communicate in a way that, that, that gets across to you. And you go like, you're saying the same thing. And I go like, I know, but when I accuse you of not listening, people go, oh, and they get defensive. But when I say, this is my story, nobody goes like, nobody, and nobody can, the first thing is like, it doesn't make people defensive. The second thing is nobody can argue with you. I mean, you say like, I, I feel sad. No, you don't. Right? Your emotions are your, your story is yours and no one can, and so, so if you want to avoid an argument at Thanksgiving with your family, don't give your reasons that you don't believe in Christianity. Just tell the story of how it happened to you. I was doing this and then this happened and I read this book and it didn't make sense to me. If there's one, if, if, if there's one gift I have to give to you today, if there's one thing that like brought me all the way from Cincinnati, I want to give you one word. The one word that has been the most helpful to me in, 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 in forging healthy relationships with the Christians that are around me. And that word is can't. I never tell Christians why I don't believe in God or why I won't believe in God or why I'm glad I don't believe in God. I always tell them why I can't believe in God. I'm not able to. I lost the ability. You see, but that, that makes it sound weak. And they go, no, it makes it sound impossible, which is what it is. So I, said to, so I say to my dad, not, I won't believe in that. I reject your God. I renounce your God. I just got, there came a point in my life, dad, where I couldn't make it work anymore. I tried so hard to stay a Christian because I, I, I liked being part of the church and I had a job and I had friends and I, I had an identity there. And, and so like when I say I can't believe in God, you got to believe me. I had nothing to gain and everything to lose. But I couldn't do it. And I still can't. 
And invariably, they'll say to you, I don't see why. And then you say, but aren't there things that you can't believe? Like, you don't believe in Islam, do you? And I said, if I put a gun to your head and said, I'm going to kill your whole family and you're going to lose everything unless you can pass a lie detector test that, you, that says that you believe that Muhammad flew from Mecca to Medina on a flying horse in one night, you're going to... I said, could you pass the test? And they'll look you right in the eye and say, what? Oh, no, I, I, I can't believe that. And I said, so you know what it's like to be unable to believe in somebody else's God? That's what it's like for me. I, I can't. The evidence you find so compelling isn't compelling to me. It, it doesn't work for me. I'm really into confessional arguing. <laughs> I can't. I'm sorry. Like, and sometimes what I think is one of the most important things you can do in, in relation to, to, your, to, your, to, your, to, your, to your believing friends and family members is to share with them the ways in which your secular humanism doesn't work for you. I mean, every worldview has a problem, right? Like, there, there, there's some things that you haven't worked out yet, right? Like, like you know, people say, like, what do you mean? And I said, well, like, for me, when I was in Christianity, one of the things I loved about Christianity was there was an ironclad case for the, for the infinite value of every human being. Everybody was important because everybody was what? Child of God, right? I want to believe that everybody's important. I want to believe in human equality, but it's really hard for me. I, I lived in some of the hardest inner city ghettos in the world, and I, I, I've met some people that don't seem as valuable as some of the other people I know, that seem inferior, seem like they don't think right, like they don't care about things, like they're, they're, they're hard they're hard, hard to deal with. And I don't like that. It's a struggle for me. And I go like, why is it that I'm, I, like, I know I'm supposed to think that they're important, but I don't. And I don't have an ironclad argument. I don't have a way back. Like, that's, I'm still working on that. I'm still reading books. Like, you go like, so you haven't worked out your whole humanism yet? No, I really haven't. One of the things that's hardest for me was hardest for me coming out was, is that I knew how to pursue goodness as a way of life and love as a way of life as a Christian. And when I first left the faith, I didn't know how to do it. Like, what do you do? Like, I used to love people by bringing them to church. Where do I bring them now? I used to love people by sharing the gospel with them. What do I, what do I, do, do I have anything to say to them now? Do I have any, any, do I have any good news for somebody? If a kid's a drug addict in my, on the corner of my neighborhood, can I go to him and say like, listen buddy, I've got a better way of life to or, offer you? And he says, well, what is that better way? Like, how do I articulate? Like, it was a hard thing for me. I hadn't worked it out yet. And you know one of the most effective things for me to say to my Christian friends was? I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. What do you think I should do? What do you think a person should do if they're really committed to loving values and they can't believe in God? How do you think that person should live? And they say, well, you should just accept Jesus Christ. No, 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 we, I, I can't do that. What if I can't do that? What, what, what do you think Jesus would want me to do? It's a very effective question. So I'm making it their problem. See, at first it was I was their problem. But now I'm not their problem. I'm, 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 I'm coming to them for help. What do you think I should do? What, 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 do you think Jesus would rather me like join a motorcycle gang or do you think he would rather me like join a community like Oasis? What do you think? And I was, oh, I think Jesus would rather you be with nice people. And, and you know, Do you think Jesus would want me to volunteer at the local food bank or do you think he would want me to like, you know, Produce child pornography. And go, oh, Jesus would much rather you be at the food bank. And you're like, okay, so, and all of a sudden they're trying to figure out, like, what does Jesus want a person like you or I to do? And that's a very good place for them to be. 
Heck, I don't just ask for their advice. I ask them to pray for me. I know, I know, I know secular humans who get very irritated when, when, they, when their family says, we're praying for you, Joey. And they go like, ah, fuck you. I ask Christians to pray for me. I ask them to pray for me in very specific... First of all, I ask them to pray for me because... When, and, and, and I take it as a compliment when they say they are praying for me because honestly, that's their language of love. When they're saying... When, what, what they're really saying is, I care about you. I want the best for you. And I take it that way. I say, yeah, I want you to pray for me. And they say, well, I'm praying that God would give me faith. I go, you know, that's a really good idea. I always encourage my Christian friends, rather than talking to me about my lack of faith, you should talk to God. Because the Bible teaches that we are saved by grace through faith. And this, not of yourself, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. My Aunt Rose was great at this. My Aunt Rose said, oh, Bart. You know, she was mortified by my leaving the faith. She said, oh, Bart. She said, I pray for you every night. I'm, I'm not going to talk to you because, like, it's not your fault. God's the one who gives faith, and I'm, I talk to him every night and say, give that boy some faith. I say, thank you, Aunt Rose. Keep talking to God, and don't talk to me. But more than that, I, I ask them, to, I, say, I say to them, you trust God, don't you? And they all say, yes, I trust God. I said, Will you trust God with my destiny? You keep telling me that God is loving and kind and it's not his will that anyone should burn in hell. It's not his will that any, anyone should perish. I said, will you trust God with my destiny? Will you? Because you believe in a God who is able to do abundantly more than we could ever hope or ask or expect. And you say, wait a second, you don't quote scripture to Christians. Of course I do. That's the language that they understand. And there's lots of stuff in their Bible that would suggest that God saves everybody, not just Christians. That's a very specific interpretation of the Bible. But there's a wonderful verse in, per, in, in 1 Timothy. This is a now, and, and, and we have put our faith in the living God who is the Savior of all men, and especially those who believe. Not only those who believe, especially those who believe. You say, you quote scripture to Christians? Of course I do. That's their language. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give them a Christian way of believing that I might not be going to go to hell after all. Because you would be surprised if you can relieve a Christian of their fear of your eternal damnation, oftentimes they'll, they'll let up. They're stuck with trying to convert you. If, if, it's, if their thing was true, it would be unkind and horrible if they didn't try to convert you. As a matter of fact, if you have evangelical friends and family members that are not actively trying to convert you, they don't like you. <laughs> the thing you have to remember is that leaving the faith is, for, for them, your leaving the faith feels like a huge attack. It feels like a huge judgment. You're basically saying, this thing that is the center of your life, the thing that's the most important to you, that you think makes you a, a good and moral person, I don't need it. Which is another way of saying what? I'm better than you. And that hurts. It hurts when somebody judges you that way. You, 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 what they see, what they're sort of thinking is like, you think you don't need the thing that I absolutely depend upon. And that makes them want to cut you down to size and show you that there are problems with you. And, and so, you know, what I find myself th doing is they're going to, it's much easier to talk to somebody if you recognize that they think you're scary. And, and you may not feel scary, but just sitting here today, you're a terrifying challenge. You're a terrifying rebuke to anybody who says that a person can't live a meaningful life without God. Apart from me, the Bible says you can do nothing. Every day that you raise your kids, every day that you're 
a good worker, every day that you're kind, every time that you sacrifice for somebody else, every time you do a good deed or give money to a charity or build a new friendship or reach out to a, a lonely person and, and care for them, you, you're doing something. And that's scary. And it's good to remember that you're scary because it'll make you nicer. And I want you to be nicer. Because there's a lot of secular people out there that have given us a very bad name. Not because they're not intelligent, not because they're not rational, not because they don't have great arguments, but because they're not very kind. Because they've forgotten something. And this is the fifth and maybe the most important thing I'll have to say to you is, you want to do well with non-Christians? Figure out why you're there in the first place. Why are you even in this conversation? What are you trying to do? Like, it's Thanksgiving, and you're at the table, and somebody pulls you into it. You're, 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 you're at work, and somebody says something about their church, and say, where do you go to church? And you're, and, you're, and you're pulled into it. And the question I have for you is like, why, what, are you, what are you trying to do? When you respond to that question, what are you trying to do? And what I would say is, you should figure out and be sure it's about love or neighborliness or civility and not about winning. A lot of times in our conversations, we're trying to win the conversation. And what I would suggest is that if you're trying to win a conversation with a believer, you must not be very secure in your unbelief. Because if you know that you're all right, then you're free to do something different in that conversation. To try to understand. To try to encourage. To try to connect. You're free to try to be a blessing in the life of somebody who's caught in a very difficult worldview. A worldview that's crumbling, a worldview that's losing currency, a worldview that you and I both know haunts even the people who believe in it. A worldview that makes them afraid that they're not good enough. A worldview that tells them that they don't belong, that they're worthy of damnation. It's a tough place that they're in. And so you should, if you have any compassion at all, you should want to connect. You should want to encourage. You should want to understand. Here's my question. In your relationships with believers, what's a win for you? Like, it, you have this conversation. When you walk away from it, what's a win? What, what does it look like? like does, is it a win if that person's feeling bad? Is it a win if you've shown them that you're smarter than them? Or is it a win if they say, wow, I really felt listened to. Wow, that secular person... There's an authenticity about them. Wow, they, they were really open with me. Is it a win when they feel like they've made a friend? So, gosh, that's not always the conversation I've had. <laughs> like, okay, don't worry. There are new chances coming this week. <laughs> and there's, al there's always that opportunity. And you say, well, well, but what if they don't engage me on that level? Then you engage them. You say, wait, you want to have these conversations with me? Yeah. Yeah, because these conversations with people are what make the world a safer place and a more civil society. You, you want to like actually, like you go, like, so you might go, you, you don't actually say to somebody, hey, you go to church, right? Knowing that they do. Yeah. How's that work? Like, what do you like about your church? What's going like, and, and you're like, but you, you just know they're going to ask you, where do you go to church? And you're going to say that. I, 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 yeah, I want to be in that conversation. Because it's an opportunity to make the world a better place. And it's an opportunity to, to, to plant a little flag in a Christian heart that says, there's a way to be secular that doesn't mean you have to give up being loving. 
And sometimes that's the only thing that keeps people in the game is because they're afraid that if they leave, they won't ever find fellowship with loving people again. Because that's what they told me. They told me that if I left the faith, I would have no reason to be moral, I would have no fellowship, I would be alone in a world, I would become a bad person, and I didn't want to become a bad person. So every time you engage somebody in a conversation in which you demonstrate care and understanding and love, you make it more possible for that person to think their way out the way you did. Last thing I'll say is uh, this stuff works really good in one-on-one -on -one conversations. It doesn't work so well in a group, does it? Thanksgiving table, somebody goes you at the table, says something, and, and, every, and, you know, and, and, and you're stuck. Has anyone ever been in that situation where like, you're, you're in a group and somebody sort of backs you down or, or, or tries to goad you into a, in, in talking about it? Like, what do you do? And, and, and I'll tell you what, what I do in a group when somebody says something like, that's what I love about Trump. I love that he just, you know, he's, he's just for the church. And I, I used to argue, and I don't. You know what I do now? This, this is my, 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 my second gem for you. The first is can't. The second is, wow. It's, it works better if you're bald. Some of you bald people. What I do in a group setting when somebody says something ridiculous, I just slap my forehead and I go, like, wow. I think differently about that. I just go, wow, I, I see that very differently. And of course, as soon as you do that, you instantly become the most interesting person in the room. Everybody turns and looks at you and says, and then usually the person that just said the, the terrible thing says, oh yeah, what do you think? And then I go like, I actually don't think this is the right setting for that kind of conversation. But I'll tell you what, if you really want to find, like, I'd be glad to talk to you about this. Maybe we should have lunch sometime next week, or you want to, you want to go for a walk, or like, like, like talk. guess what? Nine times out of ten, what? That person doesn't really want to know what you think. They just wanted to make a statement that would make you uncomfortable. And you're sitting there, and sometimes we don't say anything because we don't want to blow up Thanksgiving dinner, and then we feel like we sold out, or like we're weak, or, and that's why, like, I'm going to go on the record. Wow! I see that differently and then I'm not going to go, I'm not going to fight it out in front of people. Because people who want to argue with you when there's more than one person around, they don't want to argue. They don't want to figure things out. They don't want to understand. They don't want to connect. They want to perform. And I'm not interested in argument as a performance sport. So one-on-one, -on -one I seek to connect and I seek to engage. In a group, I just seek to stake out the right and go, I'm not with you on this. And I, don't want to find, and, 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 I, and I don't think this is the place to talk about it. The last thing I'll tell you, I, I, I can't tell many people this, but I'm, this is where I'll end. The last thing I'd say is when you're talking to secular people, don't tell them what you believe, tell them your story. For you guys, you're really lucky. You know where your story ends? It ends with, and then I found a group of people that I felt like I could connect with. And we get together and we talk about how to be a better person, how to be more compassionate, how to appreciate this life more. We, we listen to talks about science because we think this life is so precious and, and, and we listen to talks about science because it just makes us more, think it's more awesome that we got to be alive in the first place. You tell them about your group. You tell them about somebody who was lonely who came to your group and found friendship. I met a guy last night who met his wife at Oasis. You know, you tell them like people meet each other. We have, a, we, have a, we have a shared value system. I, I, it's, I, I'm, I'm 26 years old and I got friends who are 60 and 70. Like it's an intergenerational community. Where else do you get to do that? Tell them about your group. That's what I do. When I first became secular, I'll just tell you one story and I'm done. When I first became secular, I was uh, living in, in an inner city neighborhood in Cincinnati. And I was deconverting and so were a bunch of my fellow Christian missionary buddies. We were all sort of on our way out. But we kept, but we, we had a group in our, in our neighborhood that had dinner together every Sunday, every, every Tuesday night. It was, it was us do-gooders, you know, us, us kind of do-gooders in the neighborhood. And it was a bunch of ghetto people that I had gotten to know at this local soup kitchen. People that were really struggling. And it was a beautiful thing. Like, you know, we'd eat dinner together, we became friends. And, you know, when you're friends with poor people, you end up 
doing interest, you clean bed bugs out of houses, you, you do literacy stuff, you visit people in jail, because those are your neighbors. And uh, I was part of this group, and there, and, and there was this homeless guy in the group um, named Danny. Danny was about 40 years old, and I got to know him when he was in a beef with somebody else in our community. I got to know Danny like he was 50 years old. He'd been in and out of prison all of his life. He, he'd, become, he'd, he'd been kicked out of his house when he was 14 years old, lived on the streets. He had dr drug addicts. He'd been shot three times, been stabbed five. I mean, like, he wasn't going to be okay. You know what I mean? Like, he wasn't ever going to be okay. But he was a sweet guy. And he had dinner with us every Tuesday night, and I really liked him. And every, every few months, I would say to him, hey, Danny, you know, there's this apartment in the neighborhood. It does, it does low-income housing. Like, I can fill out the paperwork for you, and you can get in there. You can, it'll cost you 25 bucks a month. It's, it's totally federally subsidized. Get you off the street. And you go, man, I, I can't handle that sort of thing. I can't handle that responsibility. It's like, isn't it, like it's 25 bucks a month. Like, you spend more than that on beer in a week. Like, I, like I'll... If you can't make it, I'll pay it. Like, I just want you off the street. Because, you know, if you're friends with somebody, I mean, if you're really friends with somebody and they're homeless, sometimes in the middle of the night on a cold night, it's weird. It's hard to feel good in your warm house with your warm food when you know your friend's, like, a half mile away under a bridge. So, I mean, like, honestly, I didn't want him off the streets for him. I kind of wanted him off the streets for me. But he wouldn't do it. Then one night... One Tuesday night, we were at a dinner like this. And uh, I was the one, I was the person in the group that was supposed to give the talk that night, the little 10-minute word of secular inspiration. And I mean I, I, I mean, I hadn't believed in God for years by then. But I was telling the story about how what people, be, people say, like, you know, you guys have this thing, right? Like, what you believe isn't as important as what? People are more important than beliefs. Yeah, I, I believe that, but like people are made up of beliefs, <laughs> you know? People are made up of their beliefs. Ideas matter for people, right? Ideas affect the way they and, and, and what I was saying is like people will tell you they believe one thing, and the way they live tells you they believe another. They'll tell you they're all about social justice, but then like the way they live, maybe not so much. Or they'll tell you that they're an evangelical Christian and they think you're going to hell, but then like when you hang out with them, they just want to talk about football. And if they really thought you were going to burn in hell, like, really? You, you wouldn't say something? It's like, maybe they don't really believe I'm going to hell after all, right? So I was doing this, and I ended up telling this story, uh, the story of Blondin the Tightrope Walker. Any of you know the story of Blondin the Tightrope Walker? Do you know who Blondin was? Charles Blondin? You do. Yeah, Blondin was his name. Yeah, yeah. So Blondin, Charles Blondin, around the turn of the century, the last century, like the, the, the you know, the, the old time century, Charles Blondin was a great tightrope walker, an acrobat. And one day, in the middle of the night, Blondin strung a tightrope across the Niagara Falls. Now, now people had tried this before, and, and it was illegal to do it because people just kept dying. I mean, this was kind of the, the this, this was before there was the, the guy on the World Trade Center. Blondin was the great, this was the great, white whale of, of tightrope walking. And he, so in the middle of the night, he strung it. And by the time the sun came up, Blondin was out there on the pole, walking across Niagara Falls. And the word went out on both sides. Blondin's on the tightrope. And crowds, huge crowds gathered around to watch. And Blondin edged his way across the tightrope. And a couple of times, just for fun, he stopped and sat on the tightrope, laid down on the tightrope, freaked people out. And as he made his way finally from the American side to the Canadian side, when he got to the Canadian side, the last few steps, the crowd became incredibly quiet. Like, is he going to make it? And when, Char and, and when Blondin took his last step onto, the, onto, onto the, 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 the dry earth, the crowd burst into cheers. And they were all cheering. And Blondin was basking in the adulation of thousands of people cheering. And then they started cheering his name. They started going, Blondin! Blondin, Blondin, and with a great dramatic flourish, Blondin raised up his hands and he, and he silenced the crowd. And, 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 and you can imagine, like, what a, what a great moment that would be for somebody. Like, we, I mean, wouldn't you love to have people cheering your name like that? 
I mean, just once in my life, I, wanted, I, I wish I would be in front of a crowd of people and they would start cheering, Bart, Bart, Bart. Wouldn't you like that? What's your name? Ted. Do you want to just give Ted a little thrill just for a moment here? Will, will you go with me on this? Just go with me. Okay, ready, ready? Start, 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 start. Ted, Ted, Ted. Louder, Ted, Ted. Really loud, Ted, 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 Ted. D did you like it? Yeah. So blind and silenced the crowd. And he, and he said, uh, I am blinded. Which seems funny, like they were all chanting your name. They know you're blinded. He said, I am blinded. Do you believe in me? And the crowd chanted, We believe, we believe, we believe. He silenced them again. He said, Do you believe I can walk back across the tightrope? And the crowd said, we believe, we believe. He said, do you believe I can walk back across the tightrope with a man perched on my shoulders? And they said, we believe, we believe. We believe. He said, which one of you will be that man? <laughs> and the crowd fell silent. And out of the crowd of thousands, one man stepped forward and climbed on blonde and shoulders. And it was his business manager who figured, like, this whole thing's going south if I don't do this. And for the next three and a half hours, Blondin inched his way back across the tire with, that, with, with, with the man on his shoulders. And the point of the story is clear, right? How many people said they believed? How many really believed? One. Because to believe, to truly believe in something or someone is more than just to say, I think that's true. It's to, it's to base your life on it. It's to rest your life on it. Guess where I learned that good story? Yeah, in church. Yeah, you know I did, baby. But it works. It works for politics. It works for love as a way of life. It works for evolution. As a, like people who really believe in something live as though the thing they believe is true. So, so we were at this dinner this night, and Danny's there, right? And I'm telling the story, and there's like 50, 50 or 60 of us there. And when I do that, when I did the same thing, where I was like, hey, is there anyone, has anyone ever, and I looked at Danny, I said, hey, Danny, has anybody ever chanted your name? And he said, no. And I said, hey, let's, give, let's just give Danny a thrill. And so, so, same thing. I got the crowd. Danny, Danny, Danny. And Danny's face lit up. And, and, and everybody was watching him, and he, he started to get, he was really into it. And they started chanting louder, Danny, Danny. And Danny stood up. And he turned to the crowd, and he, was, and he closed his eyes, and he held his arms out. And they were like, Danny, Danny, Danny. And he's just drinking it in. And he sat down. And I said, how did it feel? He said, that felt great. All his friends chanting his name. He came up to me after the dinner, cleaning up, and he said, Bart. He said, nothing like that's ever happened to me in my life. He said, I've never had anybody look at me that way. Talk. I've I never been there. He said, I felt something. He said, you know that apartment? He said, I come by the house tomorrow. You take me up there and we sign up for it? You see what happened, right? He was surrounded by a group of his friends. And he felt loved by them. He felt connected to them. There's no God. There's no God in the room. It was just him and his community. And I took him the next morning and we got him in that place and he lived there for the last 15 years of his life. No, it wasn't 15 years, it was the last seven years. I knew him for 15. Last seven years of his life he lived there. He died a few years ago. And every time I saw him, from that day to this, to the day he died, he would say to me, man, he said, that was something. He said that night, that was something, man. Being part of that group really changed my life. I like to tell that story about my group because that was just a group of people who hadn't worked out their humanism very well yet. There weren't that many of us. We didn't have cool songs yet. We didn't have rituals. But, but that group of people changed that guy's life. And that's something that only groups of people can do. There are some people that you can't fix, but you can surround in a way that makes a difference. 
and you're part of such a group. And so when you're talking to people of faith, don't just talk about what you believe or what you don't believe. Talk about your story and make sure that your story ends with. And one of the most hopeful things in my life is I've discovered that I'm not alone. I hope that's helpful. I hope that's helpful because that's all I'm aiming to be. This is a world full of people out there that are scared of us. And I think it would be a much better world if they started to see that our values aren't so different from theirs and our communities have the potential to be just as transformative as theirs. That really, we're just human like they are, after all. Thanks so much. All right, right on. Storytelling, secular humanism, psychology, wisdom, honesty, that was a badass talk. Thanks, Bart. Um, if you want to see more of him, he has that podcast called Humanize Me, and it has a poem on the icon. I've, been, I've listened to it before, especially recently. It's really good stuff. And do you have a Patreon that people could uh, sign up for? He does have a Patreon. I think, human, is it Humanize Me, Patreon? All right. So if you want, uh, Patreon's awesome. Uh, so sign up for that. Before I let you go for coffee break, I just want to remind you about the blood drive um, sign up. Alexis is going to hold up the, uh, there's a QR code to sign up for the blood drive on, in two weeks from today, April 30th. I told the blood, they need 10 don successful donations to make it worth their while to come and set up and all this stuff. So I told them we would ha meet that goal. We kind of fell short the last two times, but we're not going to, I promised them we would get 10. So sign ups in the back. We have two weeks uh, for that. Uh, and it, it will be in physically in here, so you can still listen to the music, still listen to the talk, and help out your fellow humans. So, short break, 10 minutes, meet some new people, and we'll be back for some Q&A with Bart. Leave me low where the willows grow And listen to the river song River runs by my window River runs by my door River runs so sweet Might never run no more Might never run no more I've seen the stars falling on the mountains I've seen the moon rising from the sea Never seen a sight so sweet as that woman in my arms asleep. They say that honey can heal the body. They say that music can soothe the soul. Though my heart has reasons that reason cannot know. River runs by my window. River runs by my door. River runs so sweet, might never run no more, might never run no more, might never run no so sweet might never run no more might never run no more might never run no more might never run no
All right, let's get back to the seats and do some Q and A. I know you all have some great questions for our speaker, Bart. So let's keep the questions short and concise and the answers short and concise. That way we can <laughs> go, through, that. <laughs> go through some, uh, as many uh, cues as we can. So I am going to walk around with the microphone, um, raise your hand. I'll try to get to everybody as uh, best I can. Hey. Maybe I'm not on. Oh, I am on. Okay. Check. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, Good. so it's funny, I, I, on my podcast, we, we do some episodes that are Q, Q and R, we call them, Q and response, because the absurdity of thinking I have an answer to anything. Um, so yeah, if you've got a question, I'm glad to respond. Go. Y yes, you raised many good points today, articulated some things that many of us have thought about speaking um, about religion with people. Um, do you have these written down because they were so good? I'd like to actually have a look back at a list of them if you got them written down somewhere. No. <laughs> um, I mean, the truth of the matter is, I, I, I'll tell you, l l that's a good lead into a little bit of my story. When I first left the faith, I was trying to figure out, like, you know, you're, you're, you're an ex-minister, you know, a preacher, like, what do you do? Like, I was trying to figure out, like, what do I do? And I spent a few years sort of knocking around trying to figure out what I did until I came across a book by a guy named Greg Epstein, um, who was at, at the humanist chaplain at Harvard. And the book was called Good Without God. And I read it, and, and the stuff he wrote made some sense to me, but the thing that was most exciting to me was he described the humanist chaplaincy at Harvard, like this group that he had on the campus. And I was, so, I, I, I was telling my wife about it, she said, you should go out there and check that out. So I, mean, I, got him, I called him up and I said, hey, can I come look at your group? And he said, sure. And I went out there one weekend and I walked into the humanist chaplaincy at Harvard and they had like, you know, it's like 50 college students there. And I walked in and I was like, oh my gosh. This is like every youth group I ever ran. Just a bunch of nice kids and they were like, you know, laughing and joking and they were planning to go on a trip to some prison that they were going to go do something good at and they had a they had a book group um, where it's funny their book group was they called it Harry Potter as sacred text <laughs> and what they did was they didn't believe in the Bible or any other sacred text but they, they thought like the cool thing about the Bible is a bunch of Christians get together and they read a little passage of it and they go like huh what do you think that means and they go like how could we use that idea to to live better lives and they said, you know, we don't miss even in a crazy narrative or a God, but we miss sitting around talking about how to be better people. So they started taking passages of Harry Potter, a book they all knew, and they would read the passage and they would go like, what does this passage say about friendship? And, and have any of us ever experienced that? Like, what does this mean to you? And then they would go like, yeah, you know, like, Ron was really loyal to Harry in that. Like, you know, are there any situations where we, is there anyone that you feel like you've been disloyal to? And how, how could we address And they, it was just like a youth group. And I walked around, I talked to these students at Harvard, and they were doing all stuff, and I thought to myself, I could do this. Like, I know how to run a youth group. And so I talked to Greg, and I said, this is great. He said, yeah, he said, you, you could do this. And he said, I got a friend at, in LA uh, who's the Dean of Religious Life at Uni University of Southern California. And he said, he's been looking for a humanist chaplain. I'll call him up. Both my kids lived in L.A. at the time, so I was like, yeah, that's great. So my wife and I moved to L.A., and I became, for three years I was the humanist chaplain at, 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 at USC. And what I found was, is that it was really easy on a college campus. I mean, literally, all I would do was I would put out a sign that said, are you a humanist? On, on the main green. Kids would walk by and go, like, what's a humanist? And I was like, well... You know, it means different things to different people. To our little group, what it means is that you're, you don't, be, you, you, you want to pursue loving relationships, you want to make things better for other people, and you want to cultivate gratitude and, 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 um, and wonder for just the privilege of being alive. You want, to, you want to study life so that you can just be more wowed by it. Um, and we've, we've got a lot of data and research suggests that people that do those things end up feeling better about their lives and end up sort of thriving more. And so if you want to do all the, those, those, for us being a humanist means that you do all those things and you don't believe in any kind of supernaturalism. And kids would say, well, 
I want to do all those things. And I don't believe in God. Could I join? And you're like, yeah, sure. We have dinner every Sunday night. And so like, that was how, so we built this group. And what I found was humanist evangelism was so easy. You build a loving group. And then you meet people that are lonely. And you say to them, hey, you should come join my group. And they come to your group. And everybody's nice to them. And they feel totally welcome. And you're talking about really good stuff, like loving relationships and, and, and wonder and stuff like that. And they're going, this is great. And then invariably, they would say, this is great. What, what, what do I got to believe to get in? See, when I did it, Christian evangelism, it sucked because you'd go like, they would fall in love with the group and then they would say, what do I have to believe to get in? And you would like, well, you actually have to believe quite a lot of stuff and a lot of it's pretty hard to believe. And they would still do it. That's how much they wanted to be in the group. At USC, so you don't have to believe anything. You just have to value these things that we value. And, like, and so the group grew and grew and grew and grew. And you say, why aren't you still there? And the answer is really simple. I couldn't raise enough money to do it. Like, there were Christian pastors on the campus, and their churches gathered up money and paid for them because they were like, go influence young people for Jesus. And there were Muslim imams on the campus, and the Muslim community was like, go influence people for, for Islam. And there were Buddhists, and I mean, they had everything at USC. And half the campus didn't believe in any God. I was the only person there providing pastoral care for secular students. I couldn't raise enough money because there's no infrastructure. You say, well, why, why don't I write it down? Because it would take time to write it down, and I gotta earn a living, and nobody's gonna pay me, and I can't sell it in the humanist bookstore, because there isn't one. And I can't go on the humanist speaking circuit, because this is it. Um, like, there's just, like, there's, you know, like, we're a long way away from having the kind of infrastructure and the kind of rituals and the kind of the kind of sacrificial support that it would take it's a shame because on those college campuses there are all these really bright wonderful young people who are going to change the world and everybody else is trying to win them over and and, and I wasn't don't get me wrong I never went on the I never tried to get the Christian kids to give up Christianity or the Muslim kids to give Islam I just tried to get the secular kids to give up meaninglessness I just tried to convince them that there was more to life than making rich people richer. That they could transform other people's lives simply by banding together and learning how to be good lovers. But we have and, so, and so the reason why I don't write stuff, that, like the podcast is all I can do. Like, cause it's, it's you know, and you go like, well, you, I mean, you, you must make millions on that podcast. <laughs> I make tens. You know, like, like literally, there, there's a group of people that support the podcast, and it's just enough money for us to pay the editor and, and to pay for the website and to keep the thing going. Like, you know, we, th there's no money in that. There's no money in being a secular evangelist, if you will, selling the good news that life can be more meaningful. There's going to be some day. There's going to be some day. Some, some day people are going to figure it out. All right, we have a question yeah, Go right for here. It. I think I know part of the answer. Yeah. Because it really, and also when you were speaking earlier and giving the, what, how to have the conversation. Yeah. How somebody's gonna respond to that depends on what denomination they are and how deep into it they are in. Um, I grew up truth. in Southern truth, Baptist. My sister, yes, you speak the truth. Yeah, I grew up in Southern Baptist. My mom was the daughter of a small town Southern Baptist preacher, yeah. and they were so over the top, over the top, that when my grandma went to visit my uncle in Alaska, they had to talk her into wearing pants to go on a icy river. She thought playing cards was a sin. And I didn't think dancing was a sin. And my mom kind of, she didn't want to do to us what was done. They were abusive. Yeah. They were a legitimately abusive. Yeah. Uh, but she didn't want to do that to us. So she let me take dance. But I didn't want to upset my grandparents. So I hid my dance pictures when they came. Yeah. So it really depends on how deep they are. Um, but because of, 
I had to be really, really sick not to go to church, and this was all of my entire childhood. And we learned that Bible back and forth, and I heard it so many times. But I also heard in church all of the arguments, all of the justifications. The brainwashing and the gaslighting is so insidious. Yeah, you really went they have a comeback for every single thing you said. Most of them, if they are in the Baptist church and they're deep, uh, and they really read the Bible and they're really, yeah. you know, that deep in it. But if they're kind of on the surface, and I visited some church and I'm like, these people don't know the Bible. They don't know. And I, I was like, they're underserving, they're, you know, back when I was in it, if, they're underserving if, people. If I can respond yeah. to you just a little bit, because, because of the podcast. Yeah. I have lots of people that come and they, and they end up engaging me in like long distance coaching, like, you know, like on, on Zoom. And so many of them say exactly what you're saying, that they've come from places that are so deep and they've been traumatized in ways that are so much that they're like, the kind of dialogue you're talking about is only possible with somebody who's willing to open it up, to, to be just a little bit open with you. And the truth of the matter is, is that I'm going to tell you something that may make sense to you. Probably, it will make sense to you. I left Christianity five years before I left fundamentalism. What I mean by that is, is that when I was a Christian, I was always in search of the one true and righteous way to follow Jesus. And when I left Christianity, couldn't believe it anymore, I immediately started to try to figure out what's the one a secular person. What's the one, what, like, like, do we meet together in community or is community unimportant? Like, what, what, you know, like, how shall we live? And I was, and I was trying to figure out the one right path. It took me five years to figure out that, wait a second, if it's all invented, there may be what? Many different ways that different people can make the most of their lives. It may be that this autistic friend that I have would fall apart in a community like this. It would, it would just be too many people, too, too much chaos. And that his best life doesn't involve being part of a little community. And it may be that this other person over here who's been deeply traumatized, they're not going to be able to have the kind of, kind of like freewheeling conversations with Christians that I have, both publicly and privately. That, that plant those seeds and that do those good things in people's lives because, because they got hurt so bad. In the same way that like somebody who's been ripped apart by dogs as a little child, they may never get to the place where they're going to be comfortable in your home with your, with your ch -ch chihuahua. And it's really important that when we put out ideas, that we sort of bracket them a little bit. And this is a really helpful thing you've said, that we bracket them by saying, this might work for you. This might make sense for you. This might work with your family, but it might not work with your family. And some people come from backgrounds and from families that are so toxic that the best way that they can love their family is to keep a boundary and, 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 and put distance between them. Because in a strange and bizarre way, even those crazy people that are going to send you to hell for playing Uno, because they play with cards. Um, in some weird place, they really, they, they think they're right and they want what's best for you and they think that that's best for you. And so if they really want what's best for me, instead of doing what they say, I'm gonna go with their motive and I'm gonna do what's best for me. And sometimes what's best for me is that I stay away. Mm -hmm. And so please don't take my, here's how you do it as, and you should do it in all circumstances. It might not work for everybody. It yeah, might like not I work never for could everybody. tell my mom because by the time I was totally out, and I knew I was never going back, uh, she was already old and sickly and on her deathbed so many times. I knew all it would do was just wreck yeah. her. She could never get her mind open. Never. No, no. So I just couldn't. Yeah, no. I've been at many a bedside in the last few years where somebody at the end of it is sort of like, "Will you pray for me?" And I'm like, "Yes, I will, dear Jesus." take our brother Sam and you go like you've got to be kidding and you go like yeah what do you think I'm gonna to go to hell for lying 
I don't believe in any of it. But I do believe in doing what's best for Sam in that moment. And in that moment, I'm with you. Thank you so much for saying that. Yeah. You don't have any more time. We have no more time. We have no more time. Um, however, what we do have is lunch, right? Are we going to lunch? Yes. Where are we going to lunch? You are, you are good. You are good. Because I'm going to lunch. And so, I mean, like, it's fun to answer questions in front of, with a microphone like you're a big important person. But, like, if you really want to talk about any of this stuff, I'll see you at Fred Rutgers and you can, we'll just talk about it. Okay? Does that sound good? That sounds perfect. All right, I'm done. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, we've run out of time. We have to vacate the building at a certain time. But lunch is at Fudd Ruckers. That is not a big word. It's a, bar, it's a burger of joy. It's actually really tasty. 3929 Southwest Freeway uh, on the uh, pamphlet here. And uh, Bart will be there chatting it up and uh, eating uh, with, uh, with all of us. Hey, thank you all for coming. I know Bart said about community is everything. That's what hooked me into this when I kind of wandered in here in 2016 is, is you all, the community. So plug in uh, on our meetup, our Facebook page, or the website. Uh, we have free stuff in the back. Keep an eye out for the Secular Week of Action, a bunch of events. And thank you all for coming. Enjoy your uh, day and your week. Mm -hmm.